He's a pioneer in the game industry. I don't play a lot of video games, so I was always interested in things outside of the world of games. Even today, that's where my inspiration comes from. Music, movies, things outside of the game world. He's a philosopher, he's an artist, he's a mathematician, he's a renaissance man. And he created something immortal. Virtual Fighter was a blueprint for a lot of companies on how to make a 3D game, and that was a huge deal. This was the first game that he created which had actual human characters. But along the way, there were challenges and doubts. I said, I don't know if I'll be successful, but of course, I'll give it a try. In the end, he created a new world that inspired others and redefined an industry. This is the story of one of the true leaders in the game industry, Yu Suzuki. He had an incredible keen vision on what games are gonna be in the near future. Yu Suzuki really was kind of like the Michelangelo of the video game industry. Suzuki was born in Japan on May 10th, 1958. He shows early signs of the interests that would define his career. People told me that I was different from other children. I love making things and drawing things. The other thing that I liked to do was play with plastic blocks. I would make cars and houses and robots with these blocks. But the road to programming was not a direct path. My parents were elementary school teachers, so the first occupation that I was interested in was teaching. After that, I dreamed of becoming an illustrator. And then at one point, a dentist. But I didn't actually pass the exam to go into a university to study dentistry. So then I started learning to play the guitar. But no matter how much I practiced, I never got that much better. Faced with an uncertain future, he looked into the past. When I entered the university, I started learning more about programming. I realized that this was very much like playing with Dio blocks as a child. You took different pieces and you put them together in different ways to make something new. After graduating from Okayama University of Science, Yu Suzuki begins to look for a job. When I originally came to the interview at Sega, it wasn't because I was interested in games. It was more because of my interest in programming. But the interviewer was very nice and I got a very good feeling about the company. And that's why I joined. In 1983, Sega is already a growing force in the video game market. Games like Zaxxon are popular in both the arcade and home console markets. When I entered Sega in 1983, there were very few people in development. Also, the offices were very small. Five people shared one table. It was that kind of environment. After working for two years as a support programmer, he's given a shot at producing his own project. To develop this game, I rode on motorcycles a lot. When we came up with the prototype, I would ride that prototype bike for hours and hours, every day. He puts his efforts into a motorcycle simulation and his focus into an arcade cabinet. At that time, a lot of Japanese arcades, they had what was called coffee top table arcade machines. But then there was Hang On, which was this huge machine with a motorcycle stuck into it. Hang On and its innovative design quickly becomes a success in both Japanese and American arcades. You know, nothing stood out like uh, Hang On. When you walk into an arcade, 
and then you see literally just a motorcycle thing that you can get on and ride in. It made video games more of a kind of uh, entertainment activity. It felt so real. You're going like this, and going like this, and leaning over. Oh, a little bit too much, a little bit too much. I'm gonna crash, I'm gonna crash, bam! The level of immersion in that game was just unbelievable. Sega soon follows with another Yu Suzuki arcade innovation. Welcome to the Fantasy Zone. Get ready. Space Area was a game where you're basically spaceman type pilot and you're on a jetpack and you're flying all around this terrain and there's all these flying objects coming at you. And you literally see on the screen a thing coming from a far distance and it gets bigger and bigger. There was really nothing else like it at that time. Yu Suzuki continues his success with two more innovative arcade games for Sega. Afterburner and Outrun. Outrun's a driving game where you're driving a convertible Ferrari, you're outrunning your opponents, but this is not a racing game. This is a driving game where you got one hand on the wheel and the other one around your babe. You play a game, you know, in a chair, in front of a TV screen, and so just the style was so different and it was so exciting. He was also very aware of car physics. He had little touches in there like suspension, like braking, like skidding out. He was really creating this like, you know, sensation of driving a car. Yu Suzuki had changed the look of arcades with his innovative controls and cabinets, but there is still more to do. One of the challenges for us was creating something that resembled a gyroscope, where everything would move in that 360 degree way. And if you look at all the Yu Suzuki games, all the cabinets are huge. I mean, there are these monstrous, you know, cockpit for afterburner, the motorcycle for hang on. He knew that it was more than just a screen on a little table thing, that this was going to become an immersive experience. He had this incredible vision that the arcade industry is going to become more than just, you know, tabletop games. By 1991, Yu Suzuki is already a celebrated game designer, but his next move will put him head to head with an undisputed champion of the arcade industry. I don't think people thought that was going to be a big success. So yes, it was very difficult. By 1993, Yu Suzuki has radically redrawn the landscape of arcades around the world. Moving cabinets and realism are his trademarks. But his next project adds an entire new dimension to gaming. 3D was something that I was interested in for my days at university. In fact, my thesis at university was about 3D. I'd always been wondering what I could do with that technology. Around that time, the president of Sega realized that Capcom had a fighting game called Street Fighter II, and that was very popular. And he was very concerned that Sega was always losing to competitors in the fighting game area. So he asked me if I could come up with a game that could be competitive in the field. And I said, I don't know if I'll be successful, but of course, I'll give it a try. Yu Suzuki begins production on his next endeavor, but his lack of martial arts knowledge forces a much-needed trip to China. I didn't know very much about martial arts, especially Chinese Kung Fu. I had no experience at all, so I actually decided to take a trip to China and learn from the martial arts masters. I visited the Shaolin Temple, and all these experts taught me many things about martial arts. In the process, I cracked some ribs and I suffered a bump to the head. At that time, it was very difficult for me. But looking back on it now, of course, they're just fond memories. Even Yu Suzuki, I heard say that people thought he was crazy to go after Street Fighter or to make a competitor, direct competitor Street Fighter. Apparently, one day during testing, Yu Suzuki heard one of the guys say, ouch while he was playing the game, and that's when he knew that he had some kind of connection 
with the player. That this was more than just a fighting game, that this was a, an actual experience. There has never been another game where we knew it was going to succeed even before we completed making the game. We knew that this was something that really was going to take off. In 1993, Virtua Fighter is released and audiences are stunned. The number one thing that was huge about Virtua Fighter was that it was in 3D. And that was a big, big deal. And the other thing too was that Nobody really thought that you can make a better game than Street Fighter as far as fighting was concerned. And they took a bold step in making this 3D fighting game. Yu Suzuki wanted to create a realism out of it. This was a game where they used real fighting techniques, real martial arts. They weren't doing over-the-top flying stuff. They were just punching and kicking, and it was about strategy and tactics. People flocked to the arcade and began to master the complex fighting systems. Bring out! Yeah! To be able to enjoy that same kind of sensation with only a joystick, only a button, and you're still just as excited, and you're still sweating, and you're so into the fight. Something like that has never been around. This is the first game that's allowed people to enjoy that kind of intensity. The gameplay mechanics of Virtual Fighter are just really hardcore and accurate, you know? Just like the man himself, you know, it's very meticulous, it's a very studied game. People reacted very favorably to Virtual Fighter. The success of Virtual Fighter leads to inevitable spin-offs. Virtual Fighter created an, a whole new pantheon of characters for Sega. From that, Sega created all kinds of games based on the Virtual Fighter. Virtual Fighter Kids, Virtual Fighter Master System games that were just like little storybooks. And uh, you know, you had big fat headed, you know, Virtual Fighter kid characters and stuff like that. And it really created a whole franchise of characters for Sega. Sega also brings Virtual Fighter to its home console, the Sega Saturn. So this was the first time also where people were able to practice their moves at home and then show up in an arcade with all the stuff that they did at home, you know, they did homework, and then they, they showed their skills at the arcade, and, and I think that was a huge phenomenon that kind of combined the home and the arcade. In 1995, Sega releases the follow-up to the original. Well, Virtual Fighter 2 was significantly different from Virtual Fighter. And that's when it started to get a little bit of the over-the-topness to it. But that was more for the hardcore fighting fan. Then by the time Virtua Fighter 3 came out, that was a huge, huge leap, both in technology and in looks and everything. He also created Virtua Fighter 3 TB, which was an enhancement of Virtua Fighter 3. Virtual Fighter 3 became the fighting game of choice for the Japanese at that time. If you're an expert at Virtual Fighter 3 or Virtual Fighter 3 TV, then you know, you, you were the bomb. You were the guy that people looked at you in the arcades. It solidified Virtual Fighter even more as a tournament type fighting game. The success of Virtua Fighter eventually moves beyond the game industry and Japan. In 1998, the Virtua Fighter series was accepted by the Smithsonian for the Computer World Smithsonian Award. And all of the Virtua Fighter machines, I think up to Virtua Fighter 3, is displayed in Smithsonian for everybody to look at from now until the end of time. And that's a huge accomplishment. I think it was a big deal for Yu Suzuki to have his games shown at the Smithsonian Institute. That's a big deal, is to have, you know, something like Virtua Fighter be accepted by mainstream America as a real work of art or a real you know, accomplishment in technology. That's something that uh, we all should be proud of. In a little more than a decade, Yu Suzuki changed the way we play video games. But he is about to face some serious obstacles. And, and the one great thing about Suzuki-san and about Sega is traditionally they have been a company that have been uh, risk takers and always pushing the envelope.
1998, Sega was developing their new console system, the Dreamcast. The power of the new system allows Yu Suzuki to bring a mere thought to life. Shenmue was probably one of the most expensive endeavors that Sega ever took on. I mean, it was a huge investment, and it did come under some time constraints. It was, it was been developing for a couple of years. So when the Dreamcast came around, he basically started from scratch. I think that Shemu, the reason why it's so special is that it realized something that no one had ever done before, using technology that had not been used before. Well, I think Suzuki-san was very brave to take that on. I personally like, you know, sto stories uh, in games and games with kind of long story arcs, and I like the whole epicness of it. I, I like the fact that it aspired to be something so big was, I think, very refreshing. In the games, Shin Mu follows a young Ryo in Yokohama in the 80s. They killed my father right in front of me. I will have my revenge. Shin Mu is a big departure from the kinetic action games Yu Suzuki has created in the past. The game itself is this incredible wide open world that you can explore, you can buy things, and you get into a fight. Get out of my way. And there's virtual fighter type sequences. Day turns to night, night turns to day, and you're literally living in this world and experiencing this guy's life. Yes. It was more than just an RPG, and Yu Suzuki wanted to separate that game from being an RPG, so he called it Free, F-R-E-E, -E, which is Full Reaction Eyes Entertainment. Yu Suzuki puts all his efforts into making the game as realistic as possible. He draws on his artistic sensibilities. Shinmu is a very cinematic game, so I had to study a lot about motion pictures and also have people from the motion picture industry in my team. I was able to work with some directors and art directors and scriptwriters from the Japanese movie industry. I learned a lot from these people. I think Shenmue, to Yu Suzuki as well, is a culmination of all his efforts. It's a culmination of everything that he's done. And Yu Suzuki, who's a Renaissance man who enjoys art, music, all the good things in life, he put it all in one game. Shinmu is a success for Sega and the Dreamcast system. Yu Suzuki makes it known that this is only the first chapter of an epic 15-chapter story. The following year, the sequel, Shinmu 2, is released in Japan. Unfortunately, Dreamcast owners in America will never see it. Unfortunately, Dreamcast's fate was ill-fated, and uh, Shinmu kind of went along with it. Wait! After the Dreamcast dies, Sega enters into an agreement with Microsoft to create original material for its new Xbox system. Shenmue 2 was really probably one of the biggest Sega games, and in order for Microsoft to secure something like Shenmue 2, that was a huge deal. Shenmue 2 arrives on American shores in the fall of 2002. The Xbox version of Shenmue 2 for the U.S was put out by Microsoft. So there wasn't too much Sega or Yu Suzuki involvement in it. And they didn't have voice actors that were American to do the voice acting in the Xbox version of Shenmue 2. It's all subtitled. And I think that kind of demonstrates that maybe Yu Suzuki was a little bit, you know, put off that Shenmue didn't do too well in the United States on the Dreamcast after all the effort he put into it. Despite the ups and downs and the loss of a proprietary console system, Yu Suzuki remains at Sega after 20 years developing games. I think probably Mr. Suzuki has remained loyal to Sega for all these years because he's seen how Sega has grown along with his own career. So they have been growing together. You put on quite a show, boy. And with an innovative company like Sega, 
you know, it's a match made in heaven. The reason that I am who I am today is because I joined Sega. But I like the place. I think that's why I stay. And his artistry goes beyond games. Yu Suzuki is also an accomplished painter. I know Yu-san has many projects going on in his head constantly. Yu-san, as an artist, I think draws his inspiration mostly from his favorite things and also his hobbies, whether that's his Ferrari and many other things. He draws his inspiration very naturally from his favorite things. After 20 years of producing some of the most memorable games, games that changed the way we play, games that changed the industry, Yu Suzuki is honored for his contributions with the Hall of Fame Award from the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences. Yu Suzuki will continue to forge new paths. His whole career has been one hit after another, and I know there's another hit just waiting to happen. I can't tell you what it is, but very soon there'll be a new product that will just completely change everything that's come before. You better not be lying. Every developer, every publisher is going to, you know, look at, you know, the kind of game that's actually going to sell, which means basically the kind of game that people want. But I, I think there's a, you know, responsibility on creators' parts who don't want to just follow what's out there, right? You want to go out and break new ground. And Suzuki-san is one of these guys who break new ground. We're all filled with the feeling of, what should I do now? It's a very exciting time for us, both for me and for my staff.